to build uh, an aqueduct. Uh, the valley from the city was about 250 miles apart. <clears throat> to give you an idea, in 1920, which is uh, after the aqueduct was, bu was built, Owens Valley produced about <coughs> five times more, uh, four times more water, so it could be thick, uh, than what the LA Los Angeles basin could, could produce. Okay, so you're thinking about the history of Los Angeles and how they will develop into being the second largest city in the US, they could not have done it without the, the water from, from the valley. Uh, also to put in, in context, <coughs> there were about only 7,000 people living in the valley at the time. Because okay? so we're thinking a city that is growing and will become, you know, soon have millions of people and a valley will have a few thousand farmers, okay? Uh, at the time, the Agudo was actually an engineering marvel. People were comparing this to the complexity of the, of the Panama Canal. So it was also uh, an engineering feat uh, that they could, could do it. And the city started buying the plots in 1905. And by 1934, essentially owned everything uh, on the valley. Okay? And as I mentioned before, even today, still people talk about the Owens Valley Syndrome. Every time a city tries to get water rights to increase their water supply from farmers, uh, a lot of people just said, we don't want to be another Owens Valley. We don't want to become... You know, a phantom uh, former rural community. Okay. So big picture here, the way we're thinking about this is you can think of Los Angeles as being the only buyer of water, especially after the, the, the initial purchase that they have built the aqueduct, they have a bunch of water rights and they want to buy more water rights. So the Ange Los Angeles is the only buyer for land and water in this market. And one way that you can think about this is as this being kind of a coast conjecture but now with externalities, okay? You remember in the coast conjecture, you have a monopolist that is selling pieces of land and the monopolist knows that he can, you know, he wants to extract more rents by charging higher prices today, but he's facing himself in the future in which he will, uh, he cannot commit to offer less in the future, okay? So in this case, it's similar. So the city of Los Angeles is the monopsony. So the city wants to offer little money for the water uh, but the city knows that if nobody sells in the future, the city will have to offer a higher price for the water because the needs are, are rising. Okay, so one of the questions here uh, that people have studied and also want to study is whether the city could extract uh, all the surplus. And, and in some sense, we're going to see that the, you know, whether the city could do that or not will depend on, on whether the city can commit to a schedule or not. Okay, so that's kind of one of the questions that we're not really focusing for the presentation today, but we'll, we'll, we'll come up. Uh, now, as I said, this, this will be the situation if you have the regular cost conjecture, and that will be if there are no externalities among farmers. Right? The cost conjecture, you are selling land, and whether you send land to, off, to some buyer or another doesn't affect future demand for land. In this situation, and this is kind of the key thing for, for checkerboarding, uh, people have documented spatial externalities. That means if a farmer who is my neighbor, a farmer who is in the same canal in the same ditch as I am, sells the land to the city, then I suffer in the future. The main thing is because those uh, canals, those are ditches dug on the ground, and the fewer the farmers that are still active farming the land, the higher are the maintenance cost for the, for the canal. Uh, the second part, and this is also key, is if the city is buying the plot from farmers who had their plot of land at the intake between the river and the canal, and the city doesn't clean the, its part of the canal, then less water will flow to the remaining farmers, okay? So the two thing, key thing here is whether the city is buying big farmers or farmers that have a lot of water rights and whether those farmers are located right at the intake or closer to the river, okay? Those farmers are the key farmers and those are the ones that are going to generate the largest negative externalities, okay? So one way to think about this is to think that the city is the monopsonist, but the city knows that is not just the price or the quantity of water that the city is buying, but also who is uh, the city buying from, okay? Now, most of the literature in this setting has focused on rents between the city and the farmers as a block. Now we're focusing on, again, between the farmers, okay? So we're going to take the offers that the city is going to make uh, as given, and, and by as given, I will be more precise, but it will be as given, but also conditional. So they will be increasing over time, and it will be decreased on the number of farmers or the identity of the farmer that have sold. 
Okay, so you can think about the offer that any farmer is going to get will monotonically increase over time, but then it will drop uh, in discrete jumps every time one of his neighboring farmers is selling. Okay, because of these externalities. Uh, <coughs> and the key thing, one of the accusations for the city was that the city, knowing this, knowing the presence of those externalities, will precisely target those farmers that will create the largest externalities. Okay. So in a simple setting, let's imagine you have you know, N farmers in a given ditch, then the city is willing to offer more money to the farmer who is close to the river. In the extreme case, after the city buys this farmer, then everybody's going to sell right away because they cannot really continue producing. Okay? So if this is true, we will observe two things. Uh, one is that the city indeed is offering more money to those farmers that are key to produce those externalities. And, and the second thing is the city will then try to kind of target those farms. So it's not just getting them more money, but also trying to get those offers uh, first. In order to check all these, we need to have high, heavy data requirements. So as you will see later, we have the exact date of sale, not just the year, but the site date. And we have the exact location of each of the plots for each of the farmers. Okay, so we not only know where the farmers belong to a given ditch and a given canal, we also know the exact location of each of the plots, okay? Because we want to test this hypothesis of, of the city doing the checker volume, okay? <clears throat> so finally, some of the farmers also knew about the sectionalities and some of the farmers were able to get together and all the farmers within the same ditch form a, a selling pool and then bargain one-to-one -to, -one to the city. Okay, so in this paper, we're not focusing much on, on this bargaining, uh, but this is the counterpart, right? You think the city can kind of play one farmer against each other. We want to understand why some farmers in particular ditches were able to kind of go together and get together and sell as a block, and why some farmers in other ditches were not able to do that and then suffer from this uh, work. Okay, so it's a lot today, it will be more precise in a second. Now, <coughs> This is kind of what I would see as, as kind of the debate in the literature, although most of the historians are actually siding with Hoffman here. So the farmers at the time were accusing the city of checkerboarding. They were saying, city knows what's going on. They're offering more money to these key farmers that have big plots of land, a lot of water rights, and are located close to the river. So that after they sell, we're going to see unraveling and every farmer uh, is going to sell. Uh, and then other people, especially farmers are saying, well, the city was not doing really, really doing that. The city just, you know, offer makes an offer to a bunch of different farmers. Some of them sell, sell later. Some of them uh, sell uh, earlier. Some of them sell later. And you look at the map at any given point, like this map, you just see a checkerboard, just because you know, different farmers sold at, at different times. So different farmers have different preference for sale. Right? So the key thing here is that just looking at the cross section, say, is not enough to kind of test this. Um, checkerboard hypothesis, okay? So we need a, a dynamic game to understand um, what's going on, okay? And that's uh, what we're going to do. So, so just to summarize, uh, what are the, the questions that we are thinking here? Um, in, in this setting, uh, most of the welfare loss is created by the delay in the trans transaction. So the value of the water in the city is an order or two orders of magnitude higher than the value of the water in the valley. And everybody knows that. However, the farmers knows the water is very valuable to the city and they delay their sale to the city because they want to have higher rents. Okay? So if you are a planner and you didn't care about redistribution, what you want is the transaction to happen as soon as possible. So you want the city to buy everything at time zero and there's no welfare loss. Of course, if you care about redistribution, then some other mechanisms, some other um, uh, uh, allocations over time may create higher rents uh, for the farmers, okay? So <laughs> as I said, people have studied distribution of rents between the farmers and the city. They conclude that most of the rents accrue to the city. And, and this could happen even without the externalities, right? Just because the city is a monopsonist. We are more interested in the distribution of rents within farmers. And again, we'll show you later that farmers that have even the same water rights and the same size of the land and grow, growing the same crop, if they were closer to the river, that they will produce those externalities. Indeed, they got more money from the city. Okay, so so this this mechanism, this checkerboarding, indeed, will affect the distribution within farmers by giving 
essentially farmers that are key that produce large sectionalities, extra rents, and everybody else almost zero rents. And, and finally, all these have effects on third parties. So most of the dark story of the Owens Valley purchase happened because when well, the farmers got money for the land and maybe more than they will get in, in agriculture, but then the towns people, the people that have business, the banks, uh, shops in the towns, they lost uh, all their business. Because after the farmers are gone, then there's no more economy. Uh, and actually, in a, in a very controversial issue, the California Senate uh, made the city of Los Angeles actually buy all the businesses, all the houses, all the real estate from the people in the valley during the Great Depression at pre-Great Depression prices. So at the end, the city spent more money by compensating the business owners in the town than what they spent buying the water and the land rights. Okay? So we're not going to talk about this today, but it's also, uh, you know, have the data we will work about, uh, we'll work on that in the future. Okay. And, and again, we, we still have the counterfactual, but this is the counterfactual that we're trying to, to think here, right? We're going to do structural estimation here because we want to think about different allocation of rents. If the farmer had been able all to negotiate as one, if all the farmers that didn't form a pool were able to form a pool and negotiate one to one with the city. And we we'll see if the ditches had different dissolution rules. Uh, one of the rules for the ditches was that if two thirds of the owners of the water rights wanted to dissolve the ditch, then the ditch will dissolve. Right? So this act as a threat point for the city because the city was able to buy two thirds of the water rights in, in a given ditch, then we just dissolve the ditch. Okay, so that's kind of the worst case scenario for uh, for the owners. Okay. So <clears throat> as we summarize what we're doing here, we are contributing by giving very new uh, detailed data, so information about those farmers, more than what the previous literature has done. Uh, we are going to geolocate the data. So it was a lot of work, and you will see later how much work it was. We're presenting a new theoretical model, which is a, a preemption game. And with respect to the literature, we are allowing players to be heterogeneous, just asymmetric. We are allowing for what we call externalities, which is not just that every farmer have different valuations for exiting at different points in time, but actually uh, every farmer will suffer differently depending on the identity of the farmer who exit before that. Okay, so this is what we call it identity specific externalities. It's not that farmer had different plots, it's that farmer suffered differently depending on where they are located from who is the one exit. Okay, and with respect to some other models of dynamic games, we're also allowing for time of the values to change over time, okay? And <clears throat> finally, in the econometric parts, we provide a new estimation, and that's why we're taking some time to, to finish the estimation. Uh, at the end of the day, you will see the estimation is similar to proportional hazard rate models estimations, so similar to Cox models, and that's gonna make some things easier. And I think the, the setting that the, uh, the contribution in the econometrics part will also be applied to other settings, okay? so. I know it's a lot to take in, so we'll go step by step uh, to everything. Uh, <clears throat> so I should give you a, a thing of how we're contributing to literature. Uh, there have been a lot of literature by historians. As I started with Hoffman on the Water Valley cell to Los Angeles. The Gary Leifka is an economic historian, so more recently has quantified some of those uh, rents and make a lot of contributions. This so is the theory. Part of the theory is advancing um, preemption games, and then I'm sure uh, Philip will talk later more about that. And some of the results are, are similar to another paper I have with Jorge de Villan. In that paper, we deal with a model of war of attrition. So later I will show you how the preemption game that we have here is kind of the mirror image of, uh, of a war of attrition game. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's very similar. Okay. So finally, in terms of the econometrics, as I said, we, we are kind of Moving forward, uh, doing something similar to a Cox model, a proportional hazard rate model, and, and also the intuition of what we're trying to do, of why we needed to do this, is similar to the world of attrition in Hendrix and Porter. Okay. okay. So now we can stop. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, no, I think for uh, now the motivation is uh, very clear. So allow me just uh, one second to, uh, I forgot to mention earlier that uh, Philip Schmidt-Tangler uh, from the University of Vienna will be discussing at the end for, uh, uh, so we are very happy to have him. And as you 
probably know is a world leading expert on the identification and estimation of these dynamic games. So we are very grateful. Yep, uh, we continue then. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so this is gonna be the roadmap for today. Uh, I want to show you a little bit of the data. So at the end, you know, I still feel uh, as an economic historian, so I have to show you some data and some work that we did. Uh, some of the preliminary evidence, then we'll discuss the, the theory, and I will give you um, essentially a roadmap of how we think we can identify and estimate this game. Uh, we're gonna do it by maximum likelihood, and, and, and I will, we'll see how we actually have another contribution that make this faster. Um, so so let's, let's get into this. So this is how the data looks like, and this is, well, Santiago took his car when he was still in grad school in Berkeley and drove to the Owens Valley and spent a week in a, in a motel and then spent the days taking pictures of these things in the, in the archive and, and vision. So this is how one observation looks like. Uh, so this is a deed from some mini Mosher. She sold uh, her plot of land to the city. She sold 20 acres for $1,000 and she had water rights in the BC Ditch Company. So he had 12 shares. How do we know where the map is? So this piece of text here, you have to read it backwards. So you go to the state of California, the county of Inio, you look of Mount Diablo Meridian, so you were where the map you're going to look, and then you look for round 33 East, Township 7 South, and section 18, okay? So one section is square in the map that is one mile wide, and that means it has 640 acres. Within this section, you look at the west half, of the southeast quarter, the southeast quarter. So you take this 640, divided by two, divided by four, divided by four, and then you get 20 acres, okay? So then look at this, you put in a map, in a GIS map, and you get one observation, okay? You do this 2,000 times, and you get a data set, okay? In, in addition to that, we look for what the farmers were cultivating, and this is also from the archive, and here you can see you can see here on the right, Mini Moser, and you can see how he has the, he has the 12 shares in BCC deed. Uh, she was paid $8,000 and she sold 20 acres. The 20 acres, she had 10 acres in alfalfa and 10 acres uh, other cultivation, okay? So with this, we had the extra information of what was she cultivating uh, at the time, okay? So this is important because we want to make sure how much of the price the farmers got was for the intrinsic value of the land and the water and how much was for the location. Right? You want to identify those things. So the more information we have, the better. Later, we actually, and this took us also a while, get geographical characteristics, not only at the plot, but the subplot level. So we have all the roughness and all the stuff, but not people usually do this in macro or more macro is, and they do these grids that had these very aggregate measures. Here, these 20 acres probably is divided into three different subplots because of the elevation and the slopes. And we take each of those subplots, compute the quality of the soil in all those, and then we aggregate them back uh, into the plot. Okay, so we're doing this at very, very uh, detailed level. Okay. So what information do we have? So we had the name, the date of sale, and the date of the first offer. So we're not doing that much with this now, but sometimes you will get offers and counter offers from, from the city. We get the sale price, and this is important for identification. Uh, we get water rights, so how many water acres of land they have, how much land, and what type of crops, okay? We also have information of whether they belong to a given ditch. We were doing the analysis at the ditch level, okay? And in terms of location, because we have all the plots for all the farmers, we can identify which farmers are neighbor with each other, and we can create pairwise variables. And we can also identify what are the key farmers, farmers that are larger, have more water rights and are closer to the river. Okay. And <clears throat> this is one of the key things uh, that the historical literature has focused on. Okay. So again, accusing the, the city of practicing this checkerboarding and checkerboarding means focusing on the farmer that have the plots close to the river in the sense of the city goes those plots of land then the rest of the farmers in the same canal, in the same ditch, will be cut off or we have much harder time uh, getting the water and therefore they will sell uh, right away, okay? Uh, <coughs> okay. Um, 
and just uh, as a contribution for LifeCal, you have more detailed data on the date and we have the geolocation, just as a contrast to uh, what the literature has done. Okay, uh, any questions here on the data? Uh, there is uh, one question by Daniel Garcia, uh, who's um, uh, asking whether the offers were public uh, or uh, if the city were negotiating individually with each farmer and uh, whether basically other people could uh, observe the transaction prices and things like this, or if it, or if it was a one by one, I mean, uh, like uh, one by one. Yeah, so that's a good question. So in principle, so the city will send all the offers Simultaneously, I mean, the way it will work, there will be bond issues. The city will raise money, so they will raise eight million dollars. Those eight million dollars, they will say we're going to buy all these plots of land, and they will send all the offers simultaneously. And in principle, those offers will uh, they will have a committee that will assess how much they're going to pay for each of the plots. Uh, that will be semi-public. Now, of course, some farmer then will send a counter offer back. So I would say the exact price. It will not be public until they sell. Um, but it's also a very close community. So you have also evidence that, you know, farmer will also pay attention to who is getting the train to go to the city to sign the offer. So the timing, I think it was public information. The actual price, uh, not exactly, but they will have a very good sense of uh, what the price will be. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good, thanks. Okay. Okay, so, so let's continue. I'm going to show you some preliminary evidence. I'm gonna go a little bit fast, but, but just we'll get the, the gist of it, okay? So this is, a, this is a map of the area and all these plots here are all the plots that we, that we have. Um, you can see easily this is, the color code is dollars per acre. You can see how some of the, on the south are actually cheaper than ones on the north, right? So also they bought some of the south sooner than some on the north. Uh, <clears throat> so you might think one is unconditionally over time, the prices that they offer were greater, but also in a second, it's not just that this is just, they're going up the, the valley and that's why those guys are getting more money. Even when you focus in a particular section of the valley, you'll also see that those who wait a little longer got uh, more money. Um, so this Owens Lake, this Mono Lake, uh, this is the valley. And for reference, this is this over here on the left is Yosemite Valley and San Francisco is over here, okay? So this is actually a very nice uh, area in Northern California. And here to the right, this is the state of Nevada, okay? So, so you can locate this in the map. And of course, we had tons of maps like this. Um, so this is um, the cumulative sales over time, our sample. As I mentioned before, by 1934, basically everything is done. Uh, in 1905, the former mayor of the city, Fred Eaton, went on the valley and got out of options to buy the land from the farmers. But this is before the farmers knew what's, what's going on. So all the sales that happened here before the aqueduct was built, we're not gonna use it into the analysis because at that point, the farmers didn't know that they were selling to the city. Okay? They thought it was just some guy trying to buy a ranch. So most of the action happened, you can see this, here's a bunch of different sales. Most of the action happened here in the second pool from 1922 until 1931, okay? And by looking at this, you may think that the process was kind of smooth because there's no really jumps here, but this is masking a process that was very sharp at the ditch level, okay? So this is something, uh, you can call it unraveling or clustering. And you can see for many of the ditches, well, what's going on is that a few farmers will sell and nothing happened. And then you have some farmer will sell and then everything unravels and all the other farmer will sell right away, okay? So for most of the uh, uh, ditches, the canals, what happened is nothing happening, nothing happening. And then after one key farmer or two or three big farmer sells, then all the other farmer will just sell uh, right away, okay? And this is what you will predict again when you have these negative externalities. Uh, as soon as the city has bought the key farmers, the remaining farmers saying that they, you know, they cannot really continue working uh, profitably, so they just sell right away. Okay, so that's also why it's important to have information at this level and kind of this daily um, detail, because this way you can actually see the, the unraveling. Right, you have information only as before at the year level, then it's much harder to see. You just have a bunch of farmers selling on the same year, but you don't know what's uh, going on. 
Now, I'm going to show you just a more end test. Um, just to show you a preliminary evidence before we go to the structure. Um, so a Moran test, for those of you who don't know, is just yes, a spatial correlation test, okay? If, let me show you this. So if there's no spatial correlation, if all the sales happen randomly, then you will get a zero in the Moran test. If all the observations are stuck in one side, then you will get a one. And if it's the checkerboard, which is perfectly negatively correlated, right, the checkerboard, all the red squares are not touching any other, sorry, black square, not touching any black square, you will get a one, okay? So a Moran one is a number between minus one and one that measure spatial correlation. Uh, and this is just before going into any more. So what I want you to see here is that there is no spatial correlation on prices, okay? That means it's not true that, you know, the land in some particular area was better than the land in a particular area. And that's why we are seeing this correction. That's, that's not true. I have a p-value of 0.5. When you look at uh, the timing, you actually see 0.3, so a positive and very significant uh, statistical correlation. So you, you see how price per acre is not clustered, it's not spatially correlated by the timing is. So that means just farmers are selling, neighboring farmers are selling at the same time. Now we do the same thing uh, in between bond issues because those are kind of the uh, bundles. So when they were the city was offering, and as you can see, except for this one, which is in between bond issues, this is after the aqueduct and before the next bond issues, which are a few, you know, uh, kind of random sales. All the other ones you see a high and strong, uh, so positive and statistically significant more statistic, right? So even when you focus on one particular area of the valley and one particular bond issue, you see this uh, spatial correlation, meaning a neighbor of your, your neighbor selling increases the probability of you selling uh, right away. Piece of evidence. So we to different variables and in some sense we have more variables that we can actually put together. So we wanted to do an exercise of machine learning just to see what variables are more important. Okay. So what you're seeing here is just a random forest that's telling us what variables explain more of the variance on on the price. You do the, 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 the timing will be the same. This is on the price. So what variables explain are better to explain what price the farmers got. Uh, and this one is just based on characteristics of their own farmers, okay? So as you can see here, the variable that explained the most how much the farmer got was uh, how later in time the farmers sell, okay? So the later you sell, unconditionally, the more money you get from the city. The second one was the amount of water rights that they have. The third one is the amount of land that they have. And then here you can see crops. Perimeter here is measuring farmers that will have two uh, non-contiguous plots, a higher perimeter, and those usually get also more money. And just after that, you have a bunch of variables. Uh, what I want you to focus is on, on these variables, say the top three, days, water, and area. And what happens when we also add the variables that we think are related to externalities, okay? So again, what we're trying to think here, rather than thinking of particular variables, that only affect your own profitability, and there are other variables that may affect uh, other variables that affect only the uh, yeah, sectionality, okay? Because they're variable as a function of your neighbors. When we add these other variables, we see that now the variable that is most significant in this uh, in explaining the price is days since other means the days since other farmers in your own ditch has sold the city, okay? That means. Even, even more than you know, this drift on the days, more than uh, water rights, more than land rights, the variable that explains the most um, by a lot, the, the variance on prices is how long ago did a farmer on your own ditch uh, sold their land to the city, okay? So, so we see this as strong evidence of these spatial externalities. Uh, <clears throat> and moreover, that the city was also, um, uh, aware of those sectionalities and, and kind of offering more money to those farmers. Uh, well, not this, so, so we'll see this then. So this is evidence yes, that there are spatial sectionalities, not evidence yet that the city was targeting those key farmers. Okay, this could also be consistent, the city offering everybody the same, 
uh, but then uh, this actionality is uh, happening. Okay. Okay. So we can stop here before going to the model. Just just to summarize, we, we think we have evidence. So again, we had this all this data set, and we have reduced form evidence on uh, what the city is. Uh, the, the, the data spatial externalities. And now we want to think uh, about this more carefully and see if we can estimate this structurally to then uh, uh, perform some counterfactuals. Okay. Uh, so, is there any questions? Uh, no, I think in the maybe since you only have the 10 minutes, I let you present the model and the results. Okay. Okay. So, let me go into this. Okay. So very simple what we're doing here. So think about the classical world of attrition. Okay, in a world of attrition, you have say the classical two players. You have two players, and they are getting two prices that they value at v1 and v2. Okay, now v1 is the one you get second. V1 is the one you get that you exit first, and sorry, <coughs> v1 is the one you exit last. V2 is the one you exit uh, first. So the difference is positive, meaning you want to wait. So you get the second one, you prefer that to the first one, so you want to wait. However, waiting is costly, okay? So in the standard world of attrition, there's a trade-off because if you wait and get the second object, you get a better object, but waiting is costly for you, okay? So this is the utility that you get. It's also like an all-pay option. And in equilibrium, what you do is you take the probability of the other farmer Quitting times the benefit, and you take the cost, instantaneous cost of waiting, and you make those two things equal. Okay, that means in equilibrium because delta is not changing over time, then the probability of exiting is also not changing over time, and because it's getting symmetric, then it's just what you have, you have just one probability of exiting, and in this case it's just one over the difference uh, in valuations. Okay, so. Well, it's simple, so it doesn't depend on t, it doesn't depend on i because it's symmetric and time doesn't change. Okay, you can just think of the simplest preemption gain that you can think of, which is just the mirror image of this simple, simple world of attrition. Okay, now waiting is bad. Okay, so you want to be the first one, uh, you want to be the first one, <coughs> and if you get the second object, you are going to get uh, worse. Okay, so that means the difference is, is negative, but while you are waiting, you are getting some positive profits, okay? So now the trade-off is you want to wait because while you're waiting, you're getting these extra profits, but you know, at some point, your neighbor is also going to sell. So think about this at the centipede gain in continuous time, okay? And kind of simultaneous move, okay? If we could coordinate, we would just stay in the game forever, but at any point in time, I think you're gonna undercut me and, and you're gonna take the big price. So the payoffs are the same, you know, when someone exit, everybody has get getting paid up to this point, but now it's positive. And it's the same as before, but now <coughs> you have uh, a negative here, okay? Now the one is positive, minus delta is positive. So it's essentially the same equilibrium. Now in both games, both in the world of attrition and the preemption, there may be other equilibria going on. This is the only equilibrium I got in these strategies and the only equilibria that the symmetric game is stable. And more importantly for us, this is the equilibrium in which if you have symmetric information and you take the limit when the symmetric information goes to zero, this is the limit in equilibrium. Okay, that's why we, we care about this. Okay, but that's, you know, just to be clear, this is kind of the logic behind what we're doing. Okay, it's the same logic as you will see in a game of world of attrition now with more stuff. Okay, so in, in, in world of attrition, kind of the externality of exiting is positive. So that's where waiting is good when someone exits. In a preemption game, the externality is negative. And when someone exits, you suffer. So you don't want that. Okay. <clears throat> so any questions here? Oh, let me continue. Okay. Uh, no, it's good. Okay, good. So now how do we find equilibrium in this game a little bit more general? And again, this is the game, <clears throat> again, when we have Still delta, we had delta ij. So still nothing is changing over time. Now it's more symmetric because the delta the difference in valuations is different for different farmers because different farmers have different plots or different offers from the city. And also the super skip j means that depending on the identity of the farmer, when you have more than two that exist, then your continuation value, your difference in 
staying or, or exiting, oh, sorry, and continuing the game is different, okay? Uh, but this is the cost of waiting. This is the same thing. This is the equilibrium. This is the benefits of waiting. You make the two equal and you divide by the probability of no other exits and take the limit to get rid of the uh, high order degree and you get this equation, okay? All right, the only difference as before is that now we have this ij, but again, because delta doesn't depend on time, the lambdas, which are instantaneous probabilities of exiting, are not going to depend on time, okay? So, <coughs> oh, sorry, let's go here. So, while well, you had this, the lambda t doesn't depend on time, then this is just a, a linear system, a system of linear equations, that you have a unique solution, and you can solve for the equilibrium, and the object that you solve for is, is lambda j, which is the instantaneous probability that any farm will exit. Okay. Now, instantaneous probability, because we, you know, it's the theories you call it that. In practical terms, that's the hazard rate of the distribution of exit times that you will observe in the data. Okay. And of course, once you have the hazard rate, you can define the total distribution of exit times. And if the hazard rate is constant, we know that the distribution is exponential. Okay. So. For every hazard rate, you can have a distribution of exit times. Okay? And this is also where you can see how we can identify this game when you have exit times, but there's a correspondence between intensity of what they're going to exit, which is a function of the values, and this intensity, then you can see that in the data. Okay? That's kind of the key thing for identifying uh, these games. Okay? Now, this is the general game uh, that we estimate, and same as before, but now more complicated. Okay? So now, Delta <coughs> is now dependent on I, the farmer, J, the different farmer who sells, and time. That means farmer I is getting an offer to sell, this is VIT. This is how this offer is getting over time. And WJT is the continuation value for farmer I at time T if farmer J is the one who just sold. Okay? So this could be different for different farmers. Now, Instead of normalizing instantaneous profits, we call it pi, and delta is not constant over time. And now the utility of farmer is the same. When farmer J exits, then you get this payoff pi, because you're making profits up to this point. And if you are the one who exits, then you get the offer from the city. And if you are not, you get this continuation value. Right? And again, the continuation value is lower than what the city is offering you, because you get this drop in, in utility. Okay? Now, before going to a solution, what can we say here? So we could apply the same logic at some point, but it's more complicated to solve. Uh, now, because delta depends on t, lambda is going to depend on t, okay? And if lambda depends on t, and that's the hazard function, then we know the distribution of exit time is no longer exponential. Now, no longer exponential, but it will still be a function of, of lambda t, okay? So we can still identify it. So <clears throat> the key assumption in this article, in this paper, is assumption A1. And this is just a separability assumption, OK? So think about Cox models, a proportional hazard rates model. This is the same assumption. So all we're saying is this lambda t, which remember is the difference between continuation value and selling, uh, the time component can be separa separated from the idiosyncratic component and is common for all the farmers in the same ditch. You think about the standard work of attrition of the first you know, the game I showed you before. It's just saying that Vt is equal to one, so there's nothing varying. So all we're saying here is that you can separate these two. These two. Uh, this thing means, well, basically, we need this to solve the equilibrium of the game. Without this, what you get is a very complex system of differential equations that, in general, doesn't have a solution. With this, actually, you always have a solution with some constraints on the V. And second, you will see later, this gives us a very easy way to estimate this model, which is similar to a Cox model, okay? Now, when you try to do the equilibrium, you do the same thing. And now, the step from here to here, the key thing is that you can separate this, so you can take out this BT out. And what you get is this system. Without the separability assumption, you cannot get to this step. Uh, what you get here instead of this is, again, this a system of differential equations. Uh, once you get this, it's easy to see that again, the VT, you can take it out. That means lambda IJT needs to have a common T component. 
Okay, so you can take the VT to the other side, and the lambda JT are going to have uh, a common component. So what we get is this. Okay, so rather than having a bunch of different functions that we need to estimate, a bunch of different things, what you see is that lambda IT is going to be a constant divided over the common component at VT. Okay, that means same intuition as in a Crocs model, you can first identify all the lambda i, so the idiosyncratic components, by using kind of partial likelihoods in the exit times. Then after you have everything identified, then you can estimate VT as a common component with a full likelihood. More importantly for us is that this lambda it is easy to identify, it's easy to characterize, and we know the prediction from the model is that the distribution of exit time for player, player i is going to have this distribution. Okay. Now if Vs is constant and this is exponential. As I was showing in a second, if Vs is linear, this is a generalized Pareto. And if it is quadratic of any other thing, you have a closed form solution for those distributions. Okay. And that means again, even when these valuations are changing over time, you still had this correspondence between valuation that you're trying to estimate, changing over time, and the distribution of exit times that you get from the data. Okay. Was there, uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, tell you that the uh, time is running out, so you have a couple okay. of minutes. Otherwise, we there is no time for uh, Philippe. Oh, okay, so I'll, I'll just wrap it up. Um, let me just a little bit more thing. So skip this. Uh, well, let me just say one thing and then I conclude. So one of the other key things here is that we do is the following. Uh, everything I told you was about exit times and the parameters. Now, similar to a second price auction, you don't offset the object that you want. Here, every, every game, when someone exits, the game resets. So when you have n farmers, you only get to observe for that game the exit of the farmer who exit first, right? So this is the first order statistic of the game. You don't get to observe all the other farmers. So you need to do another trick, and that's why it's taking a little bit longer, to transform kind of what you observe, which is the first order statistic of the distribution you want to observe and the whole distribution. And we had this other result that uh, in proportional hazard rates model, distribution of the first order statistics, which is what you observe, is the same as the distribution of any of the players, but the parameter is the sum of the parameters, okay? So think about again, you have all the lambdas. What you're going to observe is a distribution that has the same distribution, but the, the, the intensity you observe is the sum of all the parameters. Okay, so you just have to put this into the, your equation to estimate. Um, and then, well, this is just what we're trying to do for parameterize the, the estimation. But essentially, as you can see, everything that I tell you, you can put everything into a maximum likelihood because everything has a closed form solution and, and you can get to estimate this. Uh, yeah. And I will, I will conclude because I'm eager to hear Philip's comments. Should I stop, sorry? Uh, yeah, I think uh, probably Philip will not have any slides, but uh, please. Okay, um, yeah. Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to, to discuss this paper. Uh, I think everybody will agree that this is a fascinating topic about a very interesting historical episode that and the implications go beyond of what, what we see in the Valley. Um, and it's also clear that there are economic mechanisms at work that, that we care about. Um, primarily, I think this is the monopsony buyer that may be able to commit to a price schedule. And then um, on the supply side, you have uh, pay of externalities among the sellers in, in, a, in a dynamic setting. And so uh, Jose posed a number of interesting questions, right? One is, uh, is the outcome, in particular, the, the timing of the sales efficient? And how are the rents distributed on the one hand between buyers and sellers, but also uh, among buyers. And then also there's also the scope for, for several interesting counterfactuals that you'd like to conduct. Um, in particular, I guess the, the most interesting question is what um, if the farmers were able to, to act in a coordinated way. Um, so at this point, he, uh, Jose doesn't have, have answers yet because there, there, there are no results yet. But uh, what the paper does is, I think it, it, it models in, in a very reasonable way the uh, stages of interaction between uh, any two sales. So I think at this point, 
as a discussion, as a discussion, uh, it, it's useful to think about which questions we can answer with the proposed modeling and, and estimation approach. Um, so, so here are a couple of points. So uh, Jose said this, uh, that uh, LA, the city is not modeled as a strategic player. So if we perform a counterfactual at this point, we cannot compute LA's uh, counterfactual response. So um, this, is, this is probably a, a limitation at this point. What we also don't know, but I guess there are probably ways to, to get at this is that we don't learn LA's willingness to pay. So that will also make it difficult to see uh, how the rents are, are distributed between buyer and, and seller in this setting. So you'd have to get an idea about this outside the, um, the, the, the or from somewhere else than the results from this paper. Uh, also the question of how farmers would split the surplus among themselves uh, will, uh, will remain open, I think. Um, so uh, what conceptually where, what I find um, a bit difficult is that uh, you only consider stage games. So this came very late in the, in the presentation, I think slide 43 or something where uh, basically you say like every time a farmer exits, a new game begins. And we actually only look at this, uh, this uh, stage game quote unquote. And uh, I think, what would be useful is if you actually spelled out the complete model. So the whole game and also the whole game payoff, which goes uh, beyond these, uh, these uh, stage games. Um, one concern also that, that sort of carries over to estimation is that the length of these games is endogenous, right? Because it depends on the equilibrium strategies and um, that maps it into the data. So I'm not, it's not clear to me whether, we, whether one can I consider these, these, these games independently. Um, and then there's an identification argument for this continuation value, um, which you end up um, estimating as a reduced form. And here, is, here the problem is that this is, uh, that's an endogenous object, right? Because it depends on, on uh, uh, equilibrium play, um, especially in, in uh, subgames that, that we do not observe. And this object is, is, will not be invariant to the kind of factors you want to conduct. Um, so for the kind of factors, we need the primitives uh, in particular of the, of the period payoffs. And I should say this is, um, it's actually particularly challenging because it's not a simple preemption game as you've, as you've like as, as the papers that, as in the papers that you cite, because in a simple preemption game, the process, um, it's an exogenous process, right? Where that uh, makes it makes it makes you want to wait, right? Um, and then uh, the endogenous uh, payoffs, the period payoffs, um, only those are affected by the rival action. So in your case, actually, both are affected because if um, if I if I sell my plot of land, my neighbor may be cut off. So I hurt him that way, but I also hurt him because I affect the price that he gets for his own land. So that actually makes it um, a bit more complicated. I think it also makes uh, identification more complicated. So um, you need to get that the period payoffs and um, especially here, uh, the, the payoff externalities. Um, what also I think what was not entirely clear to me is uh, how this price schedule is, uh, how the entire price schedule as a function both of time and the identity of farmers who sold can be identified because we only see uh, these, these uh, individual price, uh, price realizations. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a fascinating historical episode. I, I think you, you model it the, the right way. Um, I'd like to see more details on the game and uh, the notion of equilibrium and yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the results and, and the counterfactuals. Thank you. Uh, oh, was that, yeah, if you want to say yeah, so a I think, words. Yeah. yeah, so I think great comments. I think uh, almost everything will be, yeah, clarify if I had spelled out the, the full model, I just say. So just to say um, quickly. If to so think of it, you can solve this game also by backward induction, right? When you get to the last stage, there's only two farmers left, 
then you only observe the price the city gets to both of them. Okay. To see the price that the city gets, just think about price is constant times the same drift for every farmers, right? And the drift is going all the time. That's why you can identify them backward. And in this game, as in the World Attrition game, the when they play mixed strategy, they're going to dissipate all the rents. So kind of the continuation value of the statement before the last one is the, bar, the expected value that the farmer is going to get from the city. So from that, you can you can kind of get everything. So it's not just a stage game. You can get uh, the whole thing. Um, another thing is, uh, yeah, we parameterize W. Uh, I didn't talk about this much. We, we parameterize both the profits by and W. Uh, key thing here is that they are coming, uh, so profits by instantaneous profits and W's are stock. So the way we W's are with an exponential uh, to, to, to bring it down and the pi is linear. So even if you have some of the variables being the same, they're entered with different functional form. So, so you can identify different parameters in both of those. But more importantly, the W have the externality variables where the pi doesn't have them. So that's why you need those externality variables to be able to, to identify this. And, and, and the, the other thing is that we have both timing and the final price that the city get them. So you think about this, if we were to estimate this game uh, as a symmetric game, because we have both the price and the time, we'll be kind of over identifying those values because you had to identify it both ways. So that means when you go to the um, asymmetric game, you kind of have, you're carrying over also this extra degree uh, of freedom. If we didn't have say final prices, we could have identified the deltas, but not the W's, right? So you agree with me that the deltas are just the drops in, in continuation value every time someone sells. So those we can identify just based on the on the, on the lambdas, right? Now to the whole thing, you need to bring the deltas and the Vs, and then you get the W's. That's kind of the, the intuition. I didn't have time to talk about the identification, but uh, um, I think that's it. Thank you for the comments. I think. Uh, I actually have a very, uh, I mean, just a, a question about um, uh, following a little bit also Philip's comments. Uh, so, given the model and the results you have now, what are the counterfactuals that you can uh, you can uh, simulate at the moment? So, the like to just to have a, an idea. Uh, well, we, we well, did you, before doing this, we're doing another estimation in two steps. So in the first step, you can always get kind of the deltas from the, from the lambdas, right? And that, that kind of, we, we, we have it. And you can see kind of the distribution of deltas. And, and what you can see is that the deltas are, you know, only a few farmers are really generating those uh, big effects. For most of the farmers, that's not... Uh, a big thing, and, and 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 you can plot this a distance to the river, and again you can see, kind of the farmers that are really close to the river, then generating these big externalities, and the ones that are farther away, are, uh, are not. Uh, but but again, this is, I want to talk much about this, uh, because we're doing out things that are uh, different. I don't know, Santiago, you want to add something? Yeah, so, so the idea that we'll do is, is as we said, when you estimate different externalities, the way you parameterize that, you're going to have each externality, distance, uh, being your neighbor, distance to you, distance to the river. Uh, each of those are going to have a parameter that we estimate kind of in a Cox model, right? So you can turn each of those individually off and see what's the effect and then simulate the game. So you can turn all of them off and then you will have a game that's symmetric without externalities, or you can turn them off one by one to see uh, what the effects will be, right? Because one thing is to tell you, you know, in the continuation value, there's a 0.3, you know, standard deviation change in the continuation value when you are close to the river. Another thing is to say, because again, everything is interactive, is to say we shut off the externality of, you know, being close to the river. How does the whole, you know, generic equilibrium uh, game change? Again, everything we're doing is taking the behavior of the city uh, as given. And again, we think this is mostly consistent with what the city was doing in terms of getting a, a panel of experts deciding how much they're going to offer to the farmers and then kind of committing to that. Uh, in a scenario, you can think that maybe the city uh, 
if, if there were no externalities or if farmers were selling different pools may have changed the way they were doing that, but the underfactual is condition on the city behavior being I mean, the same. And again, that doesn't mean the city are making the same offers. That means they're following, the city is following the same rules of the same schedule of payments. Okay, so I think uh, there are no further questions in the chat at the moment. Um, so I guess if you have any further question, you can send maybe directly emails uh, to Jose and Santiago. So with this, I think we, uh, we thank you for attending and uh, we now will take a break. So Vios will uh, stop for Christmas and uh, for the job market and we will come back on the 24th of uh, February. So uh, please check the website. We will update a new uh, list of speakers. And uh, with this, uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas and uh, a nice job market and uh, we'll, uh, reconvene again in February. Thanks a lot for, uh, thanks a lot to Jose, Santiago and uh, Philip and uh, have a great holidays. Thank you. Bye.